we'll get started then. You got this one, hold on to it, or, you know, you want to dance? <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, it's good to be back at Converge for the third year. Uh, great conference, and uh, it's been my pleasure to be part of it each year. Hope you don't remember my talk last year. I'm still circling that one off. But um, my name's Charles Herring. For those of you that I haven't had an opportunity to meet yet, uh, my career in information security started in uh, 2002. It was at the tail end of my active duty in the Navy. I served as a network security officer for the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. After leaving that gig, I did consulting work uh, with uh, largely the federal, uh, federal government for about seven years and worked for Infraroad Magazine uh, in their test center. I left that in 2012 to work for a company called Ranco, a security uh, company that was acquired by Cisco. So my day job is a security specialist, something like that, uh, for uh, Cisco Systems. And uh, I love this conference so much uh, that I picked up a couple of guys on the road here, mostly to let me breathe, because I don't breathe when I'm talking. Uh, and I want you to meet them, so let's do that. Let's do that. So I'm Jim Clark. I'm the lead information and security engineer for the University of Chicago. I'm Bill Rich. I'm actually only here because I'm Charles' parole agent. In addition to that, uh, I have 16 years in law enforcement. Uh, the vast majority of that time is spent in, in South Central Los Angeles working gang enforcement and homicide investigations. So, looking forward to being here. Thank you. I don't know. All right, I'm going to get hung up on that. That's going to mess with my dance a little bit. So uh, my day-to-day -day job right now is I, I work with the private and public sector and work with information security teams, uh, incident response teams, security operations, uh, security operations center. And uh, I have spent the last four years as a tool vendor. And so I show up and I'm trying to sell a tool to solve a problem. And uh, always running into this problem that the teams are overwhelmed. There's too much information, or the information is not the right information at the right time, and there's constant failure happening. It's exhausting. But every day we, we don't leave work with the job completely done. And that's not uh, not a place the craft should be. Any craft should have to live in. And so a uh, group of us, about 14 of us now, uh, in the WIT2 project, most of us are part-time volunteers like myself. We have a handful of full-time guys working on this mission of uh, maturing and operationalizing the craft information security. And we're going to talk about some of the areas of research, one area in particular today. But we break our research into two different big buckets. One is how do we reduce the event count without losing something? Instead of us having millions of events a day, how do we get a higher level uh, amount of information that we can respond to? So reducing or recycle to respond to. And the other is called through the craft internally. And then own the craft, or through the noise. And then own the craft is reducing the amount of time spent in each cycle. So we're uh, doing some inter uh, interesting things in both of those areas. Uh, the name wit foo is just wit, like genius foo, like a uh, little bit of skill in action, so genius, since that's what we came up with. Had other names, all of which were vetoed very quickly. That was the best one uh, we'll enjoy it. So today we're going to talk about, oh man, this is going to be frustrating. Oh, I know what it is. What is it? Talk amongst yourself. Uh, topic. Presenters that come unprepared, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> guy. Did you not know that this was what you were doing today? Did okay, I got it? I know. I know how PowerPoints work. Don't you go to? There you go. Stop yelling at us. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I had this, we had this whole, we practiced, so we actually practiced today, and this is what happens anytime you practice. We weren't even demoing anything. Now I've got people tweeting. All right, all right, stop it. Yes, so that's going to be fine. Nobody tweet me in this thing. All right. My name's Charles Herring. I'm sorry, it's, uh, we're almost there. No, this is way worse. Last year I talked about flowchart for 45 minutes. Um, it was uber exciting, uber exciting stuff. All right. But it was just useful. It's useful. It's too much fiber in that talk. All right. Come on. Please. 
Do it! Mm. All right, anyway. Nice. <laughs> it's working. So if you have any questions, that's it for the day. All right. <laughs> so thanks for coming. We'll be at the bar. We'll be at Hot Cat uh, if there's any questions about the presentation. So, but today we're going to focus on a higher level of dense, and so there's other things that we're working on, other things we have, but this is the first piece we really want to present on um, evolving the thing you're operating against. Um, and so that's what we're going to focus on today. So when we're explaining this, I thought I'd go back to high school uh, science class and talk about how... Uh, we approach this, right? Uh, how are we trying uh, to make things better? So our purpose is to help organizations like the University of Chicago figure out how to stop failing every day, how to, uh, how to improve the craft in general, but uh, organization. On the research part, uh, we're, we want to look beyond information security. Uh, we're, we're a pretty new craft. We're only a, a decade or two old, and so the things that we've learned, the paradigms that we've developed, aren't really tested. So we wanted to look at other uh, crafts and what can we learn. You know, I have a background in aviation maintenance. I worked on the F-18s for years in the Navy. And uh, that taught me a lot about process and how to teach people on those types of things. And so in this talk, we're largely going to focus around law enforcement. We'll have a couple of areas that came up in our research. And we use that research to get us to a hypothesis. Uh, what do we want to test? What thing is working in law enforcement that may or may not work inside of information security? And so the first MO that we started testing is, uh, MO, the first hypothesis we started testing is MO processing or looking at the modus operandi of a given adversary or adversaries will help us provide a higher level uh, event type. And so to do that, we uh, built some tools to take in data from other tools and run through this MO piece. So this is uh, our basic framework of just research, create a hypothesis, test a hypothesis, and there's a couple of hypotheses uh, We'll go over the day and the results. And before we get into that, I wanted to back up a little bit and give us a, an even set on what we have done as an industry in making things better uh, in event aggregation and higher level, uh, higher level processing. Uh, this is 1.0. All of us have dealt with this. Thousands, millions, or billions of events pouring into a system from, in this case, a snort for every ping packet that is flagged. Uh, unreachable or prohibited, you get an event. This can be millions of things, right? And this is uh, a lot of millions. Hi folks, I'm Geek here. Unfortunately we had some technical difficulties, so audio doesn't start back up until about the 8 minute 42 second mark. Sorry for the inconvenience. So the, ne the next iterative thing we did is we started classifying uh, classifying hosts or classifying events, right? It's uh, same exact name or exact same number of events, but they're in different buckets, right? It's denial of service or it's malware or something else along those lines. Which, in from my perspective, would be helpful at this point because now I have a classification of crime. Right? I'm no longer chief of police simply knowing that I have crime. I cannot classify the type of crimes. I can, I can, and then you know, more importantly. Got them laid out. Who, what, and where? I've got the five W's now. Who, what, when, where, and why? Um, I can start pulling data out of that, understanding. Okay, these are the problems. These are the resources. This, I can start tackling the problem, um, or at least responding to them. Am I reducing it? Not necessarily. Right? We're law enforcement. We're simply responding. It's a component of what we do. But we're just responding to those incidents. I know what. At least I know what to send there. Um, if it's a child abuse case, I don't think we want the SWAT team showing up and, and throwing some flashbangs through the back door and, and you know going that route. So there's, you've got to understand it. So this this begins to push us in the right direction. 
So uh, grouping decontextualized events is a marginal benefit. There's a little little gain to it, but you look at it in you know, the scientific world, you create taxonomies as a basis for further study. Right? So you create a research program based on that. Um, it's very difficult you know, in our realm to operationalize a response based on that. So it's useful for, you know, you can use it for tuning, for figuring out what events that you don't want to look at necessarily, um, but maybe not much more than that. And an additional problem we have is um, that often the, the classification is going to come from your tool or from your vendor. There's no necessarily common consensus about what things mean or how they should be categorized. So I don't know if you can see, but I have a couple of my uh, favorites up there. So on the far right uh, is our sim. Uh, one of the events, uh, we have some MISC DOS going on. Um, that's very difficult to you know, have a playbook to respond to a MISC DOS. And then uh, down at the bottom is our uh, intrusion prevention system uh, classifying uh, crypto wall ransomware as spyware. So arguably this is straight up misclassification, which has can have serious implications for how we respond. So classification leads um, pretty naturally to uh, kind of prioritize things. So, uh, so triaging with this level of information, um, I think of as uh, uh, naive prioritization. Um, it's it's difficult to do correctly. If you're lucky, you get to choose where you're going to fail. Um, the for my History. The, the example I always come back to when I think of triage and prioritization like this, the, the biggest um, uh, wide-scale intrusion that I had to work on as an incident responder was a compromised active directory. Uh, dozens of posts had to be rebuilt, thousands of password resets, all this sort of stuff. So in doing network forensics, working backwards in time, trying to find the beginning, I find what I think is patient zero. Uh, going back months, and it is in fact a host that I had gotten an alert about, and I remember seeing it at the time. Um, but based on uh, fairly objective criteria, I deprioritized it that particular day. It was kind of one of those things where like, I you know, hope I have time to come back to that. Of course, never did. Just got further and further behind every day. Um, and came back to, to, to biking. So um, like I said, it's, if you're lucky, you get to choose where to fail. If it's not, then it's just sort of luck of the draw. So remember, this is a this is a map, and we've got you know, little quadrants in there, and we've got an increase in a particular type of crime in red, in dark red, and decrease in blue. Um, so what? How am I going to respond to this? It doesn't it doesn't clarify. I'm looking at this, and I understand that. So okay, well. I'm going to move my resources up to the hot red zone. I put all my resources there. What does that do to the rest of the city? I've got my entire gang unit up there. I've got my vice unit up there. Because I want to take a multi-dimensional approach, right? I want my vice guy, I want my narco guy. And now I'm, I'm, I'm not solving anything, except maybe improving the quality of life in that four and a half square blocks right there, and the rest of the city is going to pieces. So simply prioritizing something and moving assets there, um, you know, we're not accomplishing our mission of securing uh, you know, our community and making them feel safe, and reducing incidents to the to the And so that puts us at, at that point of evolution, we can't respond to everything. We're failing almost every time. We, if we get some, anything done, uh, that's great. Uh, move into something the industry's been doing pretty well in, in the recent years is uh, moving from event-centric detection to uh, entity-based detection, looking at uh, instead of uh, there's 500 malware events, what hosts have generated malware events, right? So you're looking at the host itself or for the users attached to it, and you're operating against the actual uh, entity instead of looking at many events. Uh, so this is a big step forward, but it, it comes with some uh, caveats. So this, to, to make this really work, it, it assumes that the, the host has a stable identity. You know, it's, you know, stable IP or something you can use track, uh, you know it's the same entity from day to day. It assumes you have the right visibility, so you're not looking at it from outside of a proxy or something in that uh, situation. And basically you just have enough information um, 
about the host, create a mental model, so when you get new information from the sensor, you can make the, uh, you can uh, have a model, you can create a story or a situation, you can decide if this scene worth investigating or not. So, for, for my perspective, what we're talking about now is we're talking about focusing on um, suspects. The cliche is, okay, we've got some crime, uh, round up the usual suspects. But why? The usual suspects, what, what correlation to the crime in Anaheim? You know, this particular guy from the 1930s is shot here in a larceny, uh, false pretenses, and he's a bad character. But what, where's that? That's awesome. But if I just focus on him, or even worse, this guy next to him here that somebody described to me, and I had a, an artist draw him, I don't even know his name. But if I'm focusing solely on them, what am I missing? I'm missing the victim. I'm missing the context. I'm missing the pretense. I'm missing the environment around them that is operating. So the tendency is you can't just focus on on any one suspect. And particularly like a homicide investigation, uh, you may have multiple suspects throughout the life of an investigation. And if you don't close the loop on every one of those suspects, that's what happens when I'm in the courtroom. I did this in my first murder trial. The defense attorney got up there and was, was, was killing me. Well, why did you look at this guy? Why did you look at that guy? Why didn't you continue to do that? And you have all these other guys, but you settled on my, on my, you know, he, you're going to look at things, and you've got to be able to close the loop on it. It's just, you can't just bring a suspect in and exclude him. You've got to understand why you're bringing him in. If he's not the right guy, you're generating work. Make sure that you can articulate why you're doing this. So, uh, so the market by itself, really, this year, this exists as it is, and we go from having millions of events down to having hundreds of thousands of events. Mathematically, way better. Uh, still not operational. You can't respond to 100,000 events in a day um, with the size of teams. So this is really where we stepped in and started uh, looking at the research as, as a backdrop. How can we go from 100,000 to something we can actually eat each day? And so we don't have the answers. This is not a definitive conclusion we're coming up, but uh, that we, we were wrong in some ways, and I'm just going to share that uh, with you today. But it all really started uh, with a conversation we had with Bill about how to kill somebody. <laughs> Which led into me being here this weekend, so uh, it's been a process. Um, yeah, so connecting the facts, and, and it's for us, it's imperative uh, if we're going to put somebody in life or in prison for the rest of their life. Or I've handled several serial cases where we're actually people with the death penalty. I can't just arbitrarily bring some facts into court and hope that I can connect the dots. Sure. Okay. The details have to be there. Every piece of the puzzle has to be presented. I, I can't afford to come in with a thousand piece puzzle and only have 658 pieces. So no matter how big or small, the relationship from each piece to the other piece is very, very important. Um, so uh, in about two minutes now, I'm going to certify you all as a homicide investigator. Um, so when we start, you start, we're here we have a victim, um, and, and technically that victim is not part of my investigation yet until the coroner, the coroner's investigation first. So the coroner's going to do the investigation. The terminology is that the body belongs to the coroner and then when he's done. But that information is going to tell me a lot of things. I'm going to find out who the victim is now. I'm going to find out the manner of death. I'm going to find out um, what type of rounds were used. If, if the manner of death was gunshot wounds, uh, the type and caliber of the weapon likely used. I'm starting to develop some things that I can use in this case. Um, and so what that allows me to do is then pivot to my other resources and say, okay, uh, we know there's a 9mm used in this we know that this person is from gang A, and they were killed in their neighborhood, and this type of weapon was used. Um, I'm going to ask my gang detectives to go work gang B now, because that's the most likely um, component to, to what's going on between these two, two gangs. Or it could be an inside job. It could be a random job. Those are all other MOs, that we have, but I'm going to consider the most obvious first. My gang guys are out working the streets, they pull over a car, they got a couple gang members in the car, there's a gun in the car, they seize the gun, um, they bring the gun in, it matches type and caliber, this could be the murder weapon that's found in the rival gang member's hood, uh, the car, the registered owner of the car is from that gang, he's not in the car at the time, so now I have a possibly an suspect, I possibly have a murder weapon, now I gotta get down into details, I gotta fire the ballistics on that weapon. The rounds recovered from inside the victim matched the rounds in terms of the, the rifle and the barrel of, of the weapon. Yes, they do. Okay, I've got my murder weapon. 
partner. I can conclusively and scientifically say that this weapon killed this person. And I can conclusively say this person's dead because the coroner told him so. So this is how they died. Um, now, where's the registered owner of this vehicle? I start working with him and I go, oh, look at this. He's also a documented gang member. Oh, look at this. I registered for him on cell phone. And, oh, his cell phone pinging in the area of the homicide at the time that it occurred. Okay, so now I can place him in the area. I can place him to the weapon. Uh, now I've got his homeboys. I know who to talk to. I know who's on parole. I can start going back and talking to them. And go, hey, you're on parole, aren't you? Where were you the other night? You know, and then I look at his ankle. He's wearing an ankle bracelet. And I'm like, oh, you're the same place his cell phone was. You weren't in the car, were you? Okay, well, what's that case hanging over your head? 35 years? Guess what? You're not going to come give me an interview about what went on in the car. That's how you solve the case. But you've got to pull all those things together. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, if you go down that track and it, and it takes a lot of turn on you, you've got to close the loop on You've got to conclusively show why he's wrong. I spent almost half the time in the homicide investigation proving things, uh, disproving things, so that they don't come back later. So that conversation set us up for, that, for our first hypothesis to test, right? We have something that's working uh, to convict uh, criminals, murderers, and um, and law enforcement and homicide investigations, and we wanted to find out, can we derive something of value from that? And we're all familiar with things like Lockheed Cyber Kill Chain, uh, MITRE has the attack continuum, and these different uh, proposed MOs, pathways that the adversary takes. And we wanted to test and see, uh, the basic idea was, if we connect these different events together, if you have a machine that's compromised, and it talks to the machine that's staging, and there's privilege escalation, and uh, exfiltration happens, if we can stitch all of that together, uh, it should give us a better event to work off of instead of just all these different separate machines with separate uh, entities uh, in the space. So basic hypothesis, let's go see if this approach can uh, reduce noise. And so we uh, plugged in some, to some tools at, uh, at the university and also some other folks that are participating with us and we started looking at how to connect these things together. In the scope of the current research, it was just it was network-based stuff. So uh, was there a communication between um, host A and host B, right? The infected machine and the staging machine. It started stitching these things together in something we call uh, MO or modus operandi stitching. So this is a, an early, this is from the prototype that we're running this stuff against. And just as Bill had the body on the right, my red dot is a machine that sent uh, too much data, sent uh, data out of the network. The orange dot, same place where the gun was, is the guy that was from the staging point, the machine that was staging the data. And the guy on the green host that slid up on the orange line on the left was an infected compromised host under the control of someone outside. So we, uh, this was working. It uh, does work in some areas, some caveats to talk about. And then at the bottom we have the timeline of these communications, the progression of things that are happening. And one thing we realized is the breakdown of the, um, the paradigms between law enforcement and InfoSec, something we had going for us is Bill never gets to stop a murder, hardly ever. He starts when the body shows up. No one shows up and says, I'm going to kill someone next Tuesday, or, you know, it's not how it normally happens. For us, we can see this. If we know, if we know what the steps are going to be, we can start looking for it before the data leaves or the disk is encrypted, uh, for instance, or something along those lines. But there are some challenges. So establish that uh, the concept of an MO is useful and important. Um, saw an example of one on the screen just now. So, uh, but that doesn't answer the question of uh, what MOs are useful to look at. So, earlier Charles referenced some of the you know, better known ones, you know, Lockheed Martin's uh, cyber kill chain, uh, MITRE has some CTPs to sort of complement that. Um, the uh, those are good starting points, and those are some tentative answers, but um, I think Lockheed in particular uh, sometimes asserts that they have the answer, this is the kill chain, which I think that uh, it's way too soon to say anybody has the answer, the, the MO, the kill chain. So I think there's still a lot of room for investigation, um, and people just keep an open mind, and generate data, and look at data, and figure out what, what MOs actually are useful. Um, so now you're all newly minted homicide detectives. If the scenario I gave you would, would have been a fairly common scenario in terms of the gang or uh, involved a handgun, involved a car, or the in the car, they got out of the car. So 
the equivalent would be to say, okay, in order for this to be classified as a gang murder, it has to have a handgun and it has to have a vehicle. Otherwise, it's not gang related, which is great up until um, all of a sudden we have an investigation involving a knife. Um, so if I walk in and say, oh, it's, I'm in a gang neighborhood and this looks like a gangbanger, uh, but he was stabbed, it's not gang related. Because, right? Because if the gun wasn't used, it doesn't fit the right ammo. Right? You have to be, you have to develop an investigative strategy, you have to develop an investigative theory, and you have to work off of those. And that's, you know, that's the good detectives are the ones who can do two or three theories, two or three investigative techniques, and strategies with time, and understand work in parallel and work in concert. So, let me change the scenario here, though. If, if I tell you uh, that I then find out the victim, based on his manner of dress, is Chris, and that he was killed in the parking lot at a predominantly uh, blood bar, and he was stabbed, it's now likely to work back to a gang homicide. Yeah, this guy was from out of his sort of, he's at the bar, a rival gang, nobody had a gun at the time, and so this was the night. It is gang related. And the MO discussed earlier. So we have, we have to stay out of that. We walk into every case, open minded. What's the theory on this one? What's the strategy on that one? Uh, and how's that going to change and go over time? You have to be adaptive. Detectives that come and go in less than a year when they work on the slide are the ones that can't do that. Uh, this is my investigative theory. They get six months through it and they disprove their own investigative theory and then they don't know what to do. And you're stuck. And now, now you're failing that case for the cold. You're not solving the case. So, we, uh, we had a retreat a few, a couple months ago, that might have been ever, but we're up in the mountains in Colorado trying to work through some of this together. And I'm sitting there and we realize we're getting false negative conditions on some of the MOs, the garbage, whether we're using kill chain or attack or whatever. And so we're sitting there trying to create yet another arbitrary MO. We said, well, this can't be the way we keep doing it, right? That we keep, we build a better mousetrap and then the bad guy finds a way to act different, you know, use poison or a knife if we're looking for, if we're looking for guns. So came up with a, an interesting idea that you can do in computers that you really can't do in law enforcement, which is calculate every possible pathway between, uh, the bad guy and the death, right? And so, we have, in the test, we have seven different sets, things like um, malware-infected machine, uh, machine flag for privilege escalation, data, sta uh, data staging, data expectation, so there's seven sets. So if you do uh, in factorials, it's uh, seven times six, I'm going to get the idea, it's 5,040 possible combinations or pathways between those things. And so through that, we, we haven't wrapped this up enough to... Uh, present the data on it, but it's, it has helped us build better MOs because we're observing what the criminal is actually doing instead of telling the system what the criminal will do, right? So we're seeing the pathways, new things that they're doing, uh, which turns out to be a pretty good uh, method for building MOs instead of just arbitrarily proposing one and testing it, we observe first and then go off of it. So we take all these different sets and connect them in different ways. So there were some ups and downs of the findings in uh, this round of research. We did go from 100,000 hosts to investigate each day around that to about 100 to 150 um, incidents is what, you know, matches on the MOs in a day. And that's good. 100 is way better than 100,000, but it's still not enough. And we're also detecting these false negative situations. Things were slipping through, uh, which had to be investigated from the 2.0 model. So the things that weren't connected uh, into an MO needed to go and be investigated as a host or a user individually, right? So uh, that's, but it did help. It was a, it was a great step forward. Uh, and it did put us into a whole tangent of research around what is the right MO, what are effective MOs, how do we reduce false negative conditions uh, in the system. Um, so what we're doing is the equivalent would be if, if I, if this vehicle had 30 rounds shot into it from an AK-47. Is show up the scene and say, okay, I've got 30 shooting. Which is the way I do. Every time the trigger was pulled and that weapon fired around, that's one shooting. So I could show up and say, I had 30 shootings. Now the chief of police is going to lose his mind Monday morning when he finds out they get 30 shootings Sunday night alone. Right? And then we've got 30 shootings. i got to assign 30 detectives to 30 different shootings. I've got to assign, now I'm going to take all that evidence down and have it processed with my uh, scientific investigation people, and I'm going to give them 30 different requests for all of this, with the evidence I'm processing here for crime scene. And it's, 
it's not exactly sticky because he's got one round of the shell casing. Now you've got to go pull all the rounds out of the car. There's maybe some that aren't accounted for. And I've got to start looking for each of the 30 suspects that fired each of these 30 rounds. The end result being I'm going to probably find one suspect and the other 29 cases are going to go unsolved. In actuality, I had a similar event here, right? It was, it was one shooting, and so you take all that evidence and it allows you to look at a singular incident. Well, the evidence dictates what you're looking at. The evidence in context is a singular event with multiple levels of evidence. Okay, so going forward, that was evidence leading to a single incident. What if you had multiple incidents? So let's say we got a serial murder case, I've got five murders. Well, one of the concerns is that this person, if, he, if we really think that someone's responsible for these five murders, it's going to be a six, it's going to be a seven, it's going to be an eight. Very few murders get solved in the first 48 if I was watching a TV show. Um, they only show you the ones that actually happened. In six years in South Central, I solved maybe two or three murders in 48 hours. And it wasn't my investigative skill that did it. That's what I told my boss. The reality was is that you know, the suspect came back to the crime scene and looked and said, there he is. It's that, it's that kind of <laughs> amazing detective work that, uh, that made me a superstar for at least five minutes. Because then he asked me about the case I had solved in the month before. So I was right back in the talk about it. But, so these incidents, so, trying to solve these incidents over a period of time is not going to stop the six months. It's not going to stop the seven. In theory, if you could sh shut down one of these cases, then you may catch the suspect. But in the meantime, in the assumption is that it's the same suspect. So let's talk about a gang war, a gang shoot. you got two gangs shooting at one another. Um, solving the case, one of those murders can stop the gang war. You have five different shooters. If you're shooting back and forth, these days, you're not going to solve the problem. The problem is a gang shoot. So you have to understand that. So now you start, you got your detectives working the homicide piece, but you've got your gang detectives trying to put a cap on the gang problem, and we're looking at why do we have a gang shoot? Well, there's an influx of narcotics coming into that part of the city, and they're fighting over the narcotic traffic. So the way to stop murder number six is to get on top of the gang members, shut them down, not give them the freedom of movement to operate in the city, and get rid of the narcotics flow coming. That's going to stop murder number six. In the meantime, that allows us to focus on the task at hand, which murders one through five. So in IT, we don't have a link board, per se. Um, but keeping with the theme of looking to uh, other fields for uh, models and tools, if look at the field of uh, biology. There uh, is an open source uh, software package called Cytoscape. Um, it, what you see in the left there, uh, is a visual, it, it visualizes molecular interaction networks and gene expression and all sorts of things I'm not qualified to talk about. Uh, that's, that's what that is. So, um, uh, the image on the right is uh, a screenshot of what you see if you are a researcher at the University of Chicago and you log into the, um, the central high performance computing cluster. Um, one of the tools available to you is Cytoscape. So I want to clear the university didn't uh, have anything necessarily to do with Cytoscape in particular. My, my point is though that it is, it is a tool in the toolbox of researchers there. You get in this cluster, you type load module Cytoscape, and you can start doing research with it. So uh, that took us to a, a modified hypothesis. We believed MOs were going to be the salvation, uh, and it fell short with our limitations. So we said, what if we take these incidents that we're detecting and start stitching them together using a Cytoscape-like um, uh, approach? And so we just we brought in Cytoscape, and, uh, pushed that into the data, and started connecting uh, these incidents together. So here's a, a screenshot from uh, the prototype. So that, that top line, that green to orange to red, is the same thing we looked at earlier from the incident perspective, but it was a progression of the infected guy to staging, staging to exfiltration. And then, but we also see there's a second one that's in route on the bottom, right? He's already staging again inside of the network, but he hasn't dropped the body, he hasn't hit the floor yet, right? So it's, uh, uh, he hasn't exfiltrated yet. So the same actor is still working in this scenario. He's been successful once. We have an opportunity uh, to stop them, but this is the uh, the general idea on uh, the cyberscape approach, and it, it really is interesting. I don't understand anything about bioinformatics. I have a buddy who has a degree in that and brews beer at home all day. Um, so he has a PhD from Harvard, and, and I'll beat him up and then he's really home. <laughs>
if you want. But it, I did call him up and say, how do you use this? And it was a very interesting uh, piece. But we did also find something else that was surprising as we started looking at these events. Um, this is what we came to call the cloud of death. Um, when you start stitching all these events together, this thing would happen from time to time. And uh, you would think in your mind when you see something like this, it must be a big event, right? It's like a crime spree or something. But what it turned out to be was noise. It was an indication that uh, attackers don't normally take over 80 machines. They don't normally uh, pivot that much. There's not, they're not going to make it more complicated than they have to. And so it's like if you're, uh, if you're in bed and all of your windows are rattling and people are knocking on every door, it's probably not a burglar. Your house is probably on fire and you need to get out. It's something legitimate. And in this case, the thing in the middle, you can't just really see it, but that yellow dot's the DNS server that was flagged incorrectly by uh, the school that was reporting in. And so it was, it was generating this, uh, this amount of noise. And so there's actually two tools involved here that were, uh, configured incorrectly, and so this is a great way for us to go back and uh, fix those reporting tools. So getting bad tips, getting false leads, having things reporting incorrectly uh, in law enforcement, absolutely. Um, an example would be a uh, federal case I worked a couple years back that somebody was putting what looks like explosive devices and then dragging them around and dropping, putting them in people's mailboxes. Um, and like anything the FBI does, they get very excited and, and wanted to get as much information out to the public as soon as they possibly could without really any validation, without really looking a little bit deeper or holding back a little bit longer. So they put out a vehicle description of a delivery vehicle, mostly white with some different colors on it, blue type vehicle. Not a picture of it, just describe it like I described it. Delivery vehicle, white, I think some red markings on it, with them stopping at people's mailboxes, right? And dropping off explosives. Uh, they solved the case very quickly after that. Um, clearly not, right? So because they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of leads that, that people were calling in, and because people were assuming that maybe it's not real, you know, but hundreds of people believe that. And so now the FBI is out trying to chase the postal service around, and you know, we get on that and shoot off. Uh, but the the findings of this was pretty interesting. There weren't any false negative conditions that came into uh, into ELA or incident uh, incident link analysis uh, that we had in MO. We did inherit any of the false negatives that uh, that existed in MO processing, but nothing new uh, in this mix. It does require gap coverage in that if you don't collect all the guns, you can't connect the gun. To the body, right? If you're, if the schools, you don't have visibility that's reporting in the uh, the sensor uh, network isn't collecting the data, you're not going to be able to connect these things together. And uh, that was one thing. Uh, and but the daily counts are crazy; they're under a dozen. And so, really, we looked at this as the major crime. If you have one of these things going on, work it out. That's the first thing you work out. And then uh, go down to the, the next level, that 2.0 level of dealing with the host and the users and then start whittling away at those. And we're doing some additional research on that 2.0 stuff. But uh, the ILA, or the incident link analysis, is, is pretty exciting stuff. When you have one come up, everybody gets to get excited. You're watching uh, the kill chain, or however you want to think about the MOs progressing. And it doesn't have to just be data exfiltration, right? It could be uh, ransomware spreading, or whatever it is, right? or whatever the different MO of the individual is. And so just uh, wrapping this up, um, because my view is up, can't say that was recorded. Uh, a couple of things we founded. Uh, founded from Alabama. Sorry, came out. Uh, I am really that's true. Not that if anyone's from Alabama, we'll tie. But uh, the first thing we found was MO uh, analysis can reveal these major crimes. It can stitch things together. Um, it's dependent upon the MOs. This is much the same kind of lesson we learned in signature uh, creation that your tools are only as good as the signatures are. Otherwise, you have something like ping packet just happened. I don't care, right? Is it the ping of death or is it not? And so this, uh, the MOs are really the fuel of this. And getting those right and tuning those are, uh, are hugely uh, important. So that needs to continue. Uh, and also, we, we initially just had a linear path, that it was step one, step two, step three, step four. And we found out sometimes they skip it. <laughs> you know, I don't need to do privilege escalation because you're, you're, you have a very insecure network. I just, just log in, or I don't have to do anything because you didn't think to put a password on it. And so there's, there's uh, steps that can be skipped, or 
there's holes in our coverage. We can't see the privilege escalation because we don't have the tool for that. So we uh, created these, these bypasses, if you remember uh, from the first slide, of different pathways to get from, to the uh, to the end game. Uh, uh, ILAs are working great. Uh, uh, incident link analysis is one thing we're really excited about, and we're going to continue to uh, push that forward. Uh, the the tuning piece, which is another area we focus on, is how do we make tools operate better. Uh, this is a great piece of fuel for that, to come back and say which tools are misreporting things that are wasting our time, right? Uh, we can just reconfigure the, uh, the initial source. Um, the, uh, the false negative piece, we're still going to be stuck in this 2.0 component until we have complete visibility and have um, progressive or predictive MOs going on where the system is, is rolling around. And, uh, we also need to move our next area that we've already started rolling out is looking at connections, not just network connections, but uh, authentication connections, um, uh, file hashes that exist as a, as a connection. As Bill said, it was, it's not always a ballistic report. It could be something else that ties it, since it could be the shell casing or something else. So uh, with that said, uh, we're, if anyone's interested in uh, participating in this, and uh, it's, it's an exhaustive process to have to deal with me and the team on a regular basis, so um, be sure you want to do this, but there's a, at which food for such beta, there's an application, we're working on two things, we're looking at tools that we're integrating and testing and looking at, and then different verticals and the different uh, yeah, use cases there. The stuff we demoed here is a, a prototype, there is a, a commercial data that the team should have ready in the first week of August, so uh, let us know if you're interested in that, and you know, again, these are the areas to focus on. Today we looked at higher level events, but the tuning, the reduction of noise, and really what we want is for an organization to wake up in the morning, have a cue that they're going to actually accomplish that day. And uh, so I, I think you should have hope that that's possible, whether I'm the guy, this is the team that does it, or someone else does it. Uh, we are making progression towards that, and we don't have to lose every day. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, last plug, uh, Hopcat, there's free beer at 5 o'clock. Uh, Cisco is paying for that beer. I'm told I'm allowed to invite all of you there. Uh, and I will be there. Um, here, so you're welcome to join us. And that is it. Cue applause. <laughs> any, oh, any questions? Anyone have a question? Yeah, what's up? I can run it on my surface. So it's uh, the good, the good, yeah, so the good thing is it doesn't have to be in real time. Um, when we first started doing it, it would take sometimes 12 or 14 hours to refresh the data stack, to pull in all the sets and look at all of the uh, connections and then connect all those things together. And largely we're using uh, somebody else's horsepower. So, you know, we'll make an API call to QRadar or to Stealthwatch or to AMP or to ArcSight or something. And then it, it's, it prepares the return and then we just digest the return and then uh, connect it together. So it runs. It, uh, Four gigs of RAM on the V at four gigs of RAM and uh, four slices, and it can probably run on two, uh, two, uh, two CPUs. So it's uh, it's lightweight uh, in that regard, but it also doesn't have to be real time. You don't have I/O problems that, that uh, something processing packets would have to deal with. So, yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? All right, get out of my room. Thank you for coming. See you at the bar. Thanks, guys. <laughs>